Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna tell you three things that I really wish I knew prior to building a PC for Adobe Premiere 4K editing. Let's get right into it. So if you fall into a similar situation like me, where you don't use a Mac, but you use a PC to do you know, very powerful 4K editing, and you kind of edit on a lot of very popular codecs like H.264 and H.265, which is typically the type of codec you would get from like say a GoPro, a Sony camera, or a Panasonic camera. Also, if you don't edit with proxies because you don't wanna waste your time and have to do an extra encoding step every time you wanna edit and add that extra complexity and step to your workflow, then this video is for you because I'm gonna tell you what exactly, what type of hardware you need in order to properly and most efficiently edit 4K footage on a very long timeline on Adobe Premiere. Now, before we begin, I just wanna make a quick note about the whole Mac versus PC debate. I think if you're using Adobe Premiere, you're gonna be much better off using a PC, in my opinion, because I feel like you can throw a lot more hardware at the problem of Adobe Premiere being kind of inefficient or not using resources very well. But wait, there's the new MacBooks equipped with the M1 Pro or M1 Max that according to this Puget Systems benchmark performs just as well as my high-end desktop PC. Whoa, wait a minute. You're saying that a small, thin, portable laptop beats an i9 11th gen or a 5950X with an RTX 3080? Well, yes, but there's a caveat to it, and that's the ludicrous expensive price for a fully spec'd out M1 Max. Personally, I much rather have a high-end proper workstation at home and then have a light portable laptop where I don't have to worry about it being stolen or broken since it doesn't cost $4,000. What's really crazy is that you could actually buy a high-end desktop PC and a base model M1 Pro MacBook for one fully spec'd out M1 Max MacBook Pro. Also, let's not forget that a desktop gaming PC can print money thanks to GPU mining, which further subsidizes the cost of your initial hardware, and it also serves as a powerful gaming PC should you like entertainment. If you really need portability and all the power in just one little device, because maybe you like to do 3D rendering at Starbucks, or maybe you work in two different places, then yes, it makes sense to get a fully spec'd out M1 Max MacBook Pro. But I just don't like the idea of putting all my eggs in one basket, especially if I'm traveling a lot. Also, with the new Alder Lake CPUs outperforming the M1 Max in Premiere Pro, thanks to its inbuilt video encoders and decoders for popular codecs, Intel has reclaimed its crown as the king of Premiere Pro video editing. To be honest, Adobe has yet to fully optimize Premiere Pro for Apple Silicon, even with the recent updates. Now, yes, of course, if you use more optimized video editing software like Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, maybe a MacBook does make sense. But until Adobe fully optimizes their software for the M1 architecture, I still think that Intel still provides more reliable performance per dollar spent. I hope this explains why this video is primarily focused on PC building. So without any further ado, let's jump into three mistakes to avoid when building a PC for Premiere Pro video editing. So for the first mistake that I see a lot of people do when they try to do video, 4K video editing on Adobe Premiere is the lack of RAM. And this is a really, really big one. I wanna stress this a lot because not having sufficient RAM, especially if you're gonna be editing 4K or H.265 and that your timelines are super long, let's say more than 30 minutes, you will definitely need a lot of RAM because trust me, Adobe Premiere just loves to eat a lot of RAM. So what's the magic number? Well, to be honest, in 2022, it's gonna be 64 gigs of memory. And yes, you heard it, 32 gigs is no longer, not at all, sufficient for this type of video editing. Now, if you do exclusively 1080p video editing, which is probably gonna be outdated in a couple of years, and your timelines are less than 20 minutes, you can definitely get away with 32 gigs. I've actually been doing it for quite a long time, but I've noticed that when I was editing on my 32 gig machine, it just felt really slow, especially after 20 minutes. When you have complex timelines, the most significant impact was that Adobe Premiere would even crash. And all that work, all that type of, you know, Assembling your timeline, sometimes you don't save because you know we, we save every minute. It's something that you get you get very accustomed to when you do Adobe Premiere editing. But if you don't save that one time, you've pretty much lost hours or days of work. And that type of loss is not acceptable, especially if you're running your own business and you just can't accept that loss. So I think you're much better off, especially in the long term for your business and your career and whatnot, to get 64 gigs of RAM. It is so essential. So let's take a real life example. Look at this picture here. This is a graph showing what kind of RAM usage I'm using. And you can see that it easily spikes up to 52 gigabytes. And this is just my vacation video from Hawaii. And it's using a bunch of GoPro, Samsung photos. And you know, these are intense codecs. And if I were to have to make a proxy for all of them, it would be quite a nightmare because I would be waiting for hours and hours, maybe days just to encode them all. And it's just a big headache because you have to manage all these different files. Just throwing more memory at the problem really solves it. And after I upgraded to 64 gigs, 
it was pretty much night and day. Everything was a lot more stable, so I didn't get those crazy crashes randomly. And I was able to see through the timeline a lot more smoothly, which is the most important part of editing. And it's nothing to do with encoding the video when you're done. Now, if you're on a super tight budget, and let's say you already have 32 gigs of RAM, let's say two by 16 gigabytes already in your uh, motherboard, and you have two extra slots, you can just go out and buy another 16 gigabyte kit, which will give you 48 gigabytes. Now, obviously I'm peaking around 52, almost 60 gigabytes if I'm video editing. Well, 48 gigabytes is just barely cutting it, but it's gonna be immensely better than 16 or 32 gigabytes. And by the way, when I was doing that edit that took almost up to 52 gigabytes of memory, I didn't even have any other type of application open like Chrome or After Effects, which is completely crazy, but it's this is what we need for today's world. If you're curious and want to know how much memory you need, I have a really good experiment for you. Find your most complicated timeline in Adobe Premiere, and then just start seeking through all the footage. Let's say you finish the edit and you want to go through it all, but you're kind of just jump, you're just jumping between the timelines, kind of like you're not playing it, you're just kind of just quickly seeking through the, <laughs> the through the timeline. You'll see that your memory starts to build up. And what's happening is you have all this footage and for your Adobe Premiere to actually process it, it needs to put it all in, into memory. This is something that is also happening when you first load the project. There's just so much memory dump. There's all these thumbnails being generated. And yeah, it just needs a lot of RAM to actually do an efficient process. Okay, so let's move on to my second hardware tip I think that you should really get, and that is an Intel CPU. Now, yes, there's a very big debate of AMD CPUs being a lot better or more efficient than Intel CPUs, especially recently in 2021 and going into 2022. A lot of people say that if you get those crazy 16, 24 thread CPU chips from AMD, which you know do cost a lot, they're very expensive, they say that they can do a lot better in Adobe Premiere. Well, I think that might be true, but if you get an Intel chip, you get the benefit of a very elegant solution to playing these very popular codecs that we mentioned before, H.264 and H.265. And that is thanks to the inbuilt GPU on the chip, the iGPU, you get QuickSync. And QuickSync, oh my goodness, is absolutely amazing. Here's a crazy example about QuickSync. Let's say you don't have a GPU, you don't have like an RTX 3000 series graphics card, or maybe you're just using it to mine while you're editing. You can just tell Adobe Premiere to only use QuickSync and don't use the hardware encoding from your GPU. And you can totally encode and decode totally fine while you're GPU mining, or if you don't even have a GPU installed. So QuickSync is extremely powerful. Don't discount that. And what's even crazier is that in my third point, the, the third type of hardware that I think you should get, QuickSync can be an added bonus when you're encoding your video. So we'll talk about that very soon. With the new 12th gen Alder Lake CPUs from Intel, we get insane performance gains when editing H.264 codecs in Premiere Pro with QuickSync enabled, compared to previous generations of Intel chips and even the Ryzen 5950X. Even an i5 from last year is beating an AMD 5950X in this live playback test, which is arguably one of the most important benchmarks for actual video editors. You see, a lot of YouTubers love to do benchmarks on exporting footage, which you know is very important for an editor, but I personally really care about how responsive and snappy interactions with a complex timeline truly are. Another common fallacy with a lot of benchmarks from tech YouTubers is that they forget to enable QuickSync or just the iGPU in the BIOS, which totally cripples Intel's hardware advantage over AMD. Now, of course, if QuickSync is disabled or the codec you are using isn't supported by QuickSync, like 4K RED footage, then AMD CPUs do perform better or equivalent to Intel CPUs. But like I said in the beginning, H.264 codec is used in a lot of mainstream cameras like your smartphone, GoPro, or even Sony cameras. At the time of filming this video, the Intel 12600K is by definition the best CPU you can buy for price to performance ratio, even when compared to AMD CPUs. So in order to choose the proper Intel chip, you must get at least eight cores. So a 10700, 11700, those are gonna be totally fine. Ideally, you wanna get as many cores as possible. So 10 cores is very nice. Apparently, to the, in this, at the time of filming of this, eight cores is the optimal type of price per performance you would get when you use Adobe Premiere. Now, when are, when are all these cores being engaged? Well, like I said before, when you're seeking through the timeline, you have a complex timeline, or you're loading up the project for the first time and it has to generate all these thumbnails. And it's a very inefficient process because I don't know why they can't cache these thumbnails in Adobe Premiere, but anyways, that's besides the point. It basically needs to compute a lot of things all at once and having all these cores really make it more efficient and less prone to crashing. And for that last point I made, I think it's extremely important that you favor stability over you know performance or anything like that because trust me, 
working so long on a project and then maybe you forgot to save, like I said before, and it crashes, you've literally lost hours maybe. And how much is your time worth? Maybe your hour is worth 100 bucks, 200 bucks an hour. You've just lost that all. So paying that little fee up front to get a really good CPU and a good amount of RAM is honestly very inexpensive in comparison to the time you would probably save in the long term. So in order to get QuickSync, you need to make sure that you don't buy an Intel chip with the letter F in it. If it has a letter F in it, that means the iGPU is disabled and therefore you don't get QuickSync. So just don't be tricked into that. A lot of pre-built OEMs like the ones from Dell or Alienware, they're gonna automatically force you to get an F version, which totally sucks. So that's why I think you're better off building your own custom PC if you really wanna have the best editing rig. So if you're deciding between a K versus a non-K Intel chip, I made a whole video about that talking about why it doesn't really matter which one you get, but you probably don't want to overclock because one, you're gonna introduce a lot of heat and more instability to Adobe Premiere, which is very sensitive to this type of instability. It can crash any time if it's overclocked. So I recommend maybe just saving your money and using that money towards extra storage or extra RAM. So just get a non-K chip and then just put a nice decent aftermarket cooler like a Noctua U12S and you'll be totally fine. So for my third and final hardware tip, when you want to build your own PC is to get an NVIDIA graphics card. Now, yes, this is a really anti AMD video. I know a lot of people are going to be really hateful of this video. They're going to leave their very angry comments saying that, oh no, I love AMD and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, NVIDIA is just so widely supported for its content creation. It does a really good job at being able to use the hardware encoder and decoder so that you can efficiently create videos, you know, edit on the timeline and then actually export them extremely fast. Like when you use a hardware encoder versus like a software, like your CPU, it is literally like a blink, in a blink of an eye. It is so fast and it's mind blowing. So thanks to the NVIC, so it's called NVIC, the NVIDIA encoder that's embedded on usually 2000, 3000 series RTX graphics cards from uh, NVIDIA you're just gonna get so much bang for buck. And also it's better for mining, it's better for gaming. It's just a really good graphics card. I know they're very expensive, so you could probably get an older graphics card like a 1070 or 1060, and I should have NVENC on it, but maybe try and get the 2000s or 3000 series so that you're more prepared for the future. So a really good source for all this information about choosing the best hardware for Adobe Premiere and looking at the benchmarks is Puget Systems. I believe I pronounced that Puget Systems correctly. And they're the ones that actually found out that if you export a video, so like you encoded, what actually happens is you can actually combine the power of NVENC, so the NVIDIA encoder, and QuickSync to decode so that you kind of have them both working in tandem. So what it means is that it becomes a very efficient parallel process where the, C where the iGPU on the CPU is doing the decoding and then the NVENC encoder on the hardware of the graphics card is doing the decoding. So these are working together as you export it and it just makes it a lot more faster, which is totally crazy. And something that, you know, of course, encoding your video to, you know, to export it to YouTube is not a big deal if you can just wait an hour, but once you get used to the high speed, it's really hard to go back. So those are my three suggestions for picking the best hardware for a 4K editing beast in Adobe Premiere for PC, obviously. Now, I wanna give you one final tip, something that I've learned over the years of video editing, and it all has to do with stability. A lot of people, they'll like get a MacBook and they'll say, okay, you know what, I can use an external drive and I can edit off that external drive. Let's say, let's say the Samsung T5 external drive, which you know has 512 SSD, it's pretty big, it's pretty fast. The thing with editing over a USB serial channel is that it is not very reliable. I highly recommend to kind of copy the files onto a proper SSD on your main machine so that you can edit. And this is one of the main reasons why I don't like getting a Mac for video editing because the hardware is just so expensive. If I were to buy that same hard drive space, not on an external drive, but on the actual computer, it would cost so much money. So I much prefer having a PC. In general, I just didn't find editing on an external drive to be really reliable, fast, enjoyable at all compared to just a regular SSD connected to your motherboard using a SATA port. And of course, a really big NVMe drive is going to be a lot better as well. If you have no choice and must edit on an external drive, just make sure it's on a USB 3.0 SSD and it's formatted as NTFS and not XFAT. I found that the XFAT format to be terrible, which sucks because if you want to use Mac OS and Windows to edit, you are actually forced to use XFAT. I found that the file format XFAT to be really bad in Adobe Premiere, especially on Windows, which totally sucks because if you use Mac and Windows to edit, you are actually forced to use XFAT since Mac OS does not support NTFS natively. 
all the more reasons to stick to Windows PC for Premiere editing. So to summarize this video, too long, didn't watch. Number one, make sure you have at least 48 gigabytes of memory. I would definitely recommend getting 64 gigabytes of RAM. Number two, I would get an Intel CPU with quick sync. So don't buy the F version and make sure that it at least has eight cores. And lastly, my, my last tip is to invest in a really good graphics card like an NVIDIA 2000 or 3000 series. And I think you'll be very, very happy with this setup. If you agree or disagree with my hardware recommendations, I would love to know in the comment section down below. Please let me know. Please do give a like, it really helps with the channel and I will see you in the next video. We can probably agree that video editing is a very fun and creative process, but let's face it, there are some tasks that are just so menial boring and labor intensive that we wish we could just outsource it or just simply not do at all. And a lot of that has to deal with cutting out dead air or silences in your A-roll talking head. Now, thankfully, Timebolt, which is a really cool piece of software that has recently come out, has made it really easy to cut out dead air in your footage. And this makes the whole process of creating video, creating content a lot more fun and more manageable, especially for one person. I've estimated the amount of hours I've saved using this piece of software and based on that, it has definitely paid for itself more than 10 times. So I definitely think it's worth it, especially for the lifetime membership. Like I said, I will leave a link in the description. If you do use my coupon code, it definitely does help this channel. Thanks for your support, and I will see you in the next video.